It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the seminar on conflict trends in Somalia, the Central African Republic and the wider Sahel. Our speakers today are Andrus Atta Samoa, Amandine Nyanginon and Stephanie Walters. Stephanie is division head and Andrus and Amandine are senior researchers at the Conflict Prevention and Risk Analysis Division at the Institute for Security Studies. They are based in Pretoria and Dhaka. ISS is an uh, institute that has been a partner uh, of NUPI in the Training for Peace program for almost 20 years. So we have close ties to them. And it's an annual event that staff from ISS come to NUPI to share their insights with us and a wider Norwegian audience. Today we will hear presentations on the consequences of ungoverned spaces in Mali, Kar and Somalia and on terrorism in the Sahel, a regional perspective. After which you will have the opportunity to ask questions and uh, offer comments. So with no further ado, I'll give the floor to Stephanie first. Is it? Oh, Amandine. Yeah. We'll just move away. Okay, it's going to be fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I will give you a brief overview about the Sahel and also the Mali. Uh, the, the idea is to maybe to then open the debate about different issues and mainly uh, regarding my concluding remarks on the what are the main challenges now to resolve this conflict. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, at ISS, we are working on a very broad perspective of security, and it's called human security. So I wanted first to give you a, this very broad overview about what are the main human security issues in the Sahel. Uh, first of all, you have the environmental degradation in Sahel. As you know, it's a semi-arid semi uh, region. You have drought and which is actually recurrent in the region and which has a direct impact on pastoralism population and also the lifestyle uh, of people in the Sahel. Uh, according to the Norwegian Refugees Council report, the last one, uh, we can say that displacement caused by disaster is growing and uh, in scale, frequency and complexity. And uh, we can also say that displacement is expected to increase rapidly in the Sahel, but also in Africa, where population is predicted uh, to double between 2015 and 2050. Um, the other consequences of this is, of course, you have refugees for, uh, from the different conflicts in terms of security impact, but you are more and more climatic refugees in the Sahel. The second idea is, of course, the question about food insecurity. And uh, as you know, food insecurity is due to uh, very complex uh, factors at the, I mean, economic, political, and also social uh, factors. And to give you just a, an idea, we have now in the Sahel, 30, um, 13 million people, food and nutrition insecure. Uh, the, the other issue is about health insecurity. As you know, we had not only in the Sahel, but in the Western Africa, the Ebola outbreak. And um, I mean, this is a very interesting 
issue because that actually it's not only about Ebola, but it's, it is also what the Ebola outbreak reveals about state capacity in terms of conflict management, not only in the military position, but also in terms of health insecurity and also definitely the lack of prevention of this kind of crisis. Uh, the other, I mean, long-standing issues may be the economic impact of the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa. And uh, the link with the sale could be, if you have a look to the last report of the UN Secretary uh, on Mali, we can say that there is express, he expressed his concern about the consequences on the soldier of the MINUSMA, because in the MINUSMA, as you know, we have uh, 140, um, 164 Guinean and also 45 people coming from Liberia and four, and four people coming from Guinea. So you can imagine the consequences to have people affected by Ebola coming in the, in, at the MINUSMA. Uh, maybe it's also important to notice that uh, the Ebola outbreak is in short term a very big issue, but you have more death uh, from malaria than from Ebola uh, in the long term. So it's also important to give this in mind. Uh, the, the other issues in terms of human security is, of course, the socioeconomic issue. As you know, uh, disparities in wealth distribution and also in socioeconomic development persist uh, in, the Western African, in, West, in West Africa. And many of the conflicts are fueled, actually, by this uh, limited access to basic services. And Mali, again, is a very good example. Uh, in terms of political aspects, uh, maybe if you just have a look to the, to the, the table, you, you will see that uh, the major concern about Western Africa and also Sahel will be the next election, and particularly in Burkina Faso. Uh, as you know, the, the President Compaore is playing a big role in, term, in the process of, med of mediation, uh, by the, has played a, a major role in terms of process mediation by the past. And Burkina is still a very strong partner. I mean, his part is uh, notably part of the G5. Um, so we need to have a look regarding the decision uh, the President Compaore decided, uh, will decide to, to, to take I mean, change or not the constitution, because we will see maybe a spillover effects, not uh, mainly in Western Africa, but also in the uh, in whole uh, the, in all uh, Africa. Over uh, issue in uh, Niger and Chad, which actually will have election uh, in two years. So this is in terms of. Basic, I mean, in very structural uh, uh, factors of conflict in the Sahel. Uh, but we also have, I mean, maybe there is nothing new in terms of security issue. If you just have a look of what the different uh, challenges I, I showed you, there is nothing new. But the question is more how they can interact each other, what, in what way they can influence each other, creating what what we called in, the, in Mali actually a conflict system. How the different, the, the, these different conflicts, economic, social, environmental, health, food, how, how can they interact together? How some, how some, some, some of them can be uh, root causes, or other can be triggers. So this is how, what is the challenge actually now in the, in the Sahel? So you also have this factor of instability, of course. And uh, the main factors, uh, I mean, the first factors of the first factor of instability is drug trafficking in the region, and there is uh, uh, mainly drug trafficking, but also more and more consumption and production of drugs in the Sahel. Uh, the other one is human trafficking, and Niger is a very good example. You see. Human trafficking is not only about something at the local level, I mean, within population. Uh, the, the last case with the uh, Hama Amadou, the president of the National Assembly, showed that in what way we can have a very high level implication in this uh, human trafficking. Uh, you also have, of course, illegal immigration. And finally, uh, we see how we book the deadlock um, so it's also a very good example. 
Uh, other issue, arms trafficking, of course, which is definitely not new in, uh, in Western Africa. And uh, it's a very big challenge because the, uh, we have this prolifer proliferation of small arms and light weapons in the Sahel. The last one would be the terrorism uh, issue. And, uh, oh, sorry, the money laundering issue, which is actually the fertile grounds. I mean, drug, human, and arms trafficking are the fertile ground for money laundering. Um, and uh, finally, the last one would be the terrorist issue. We know that there is more than 30 terrorist attacks in January uh, this year, to give you an idea. And of course, the last, I mean, the, the, the kill of the, of the peacekeepers from, from Niger during the last few days is also a very good example of the instability in northern Mali. So Mali is still the most vulnerable country in the Sahel. And we can say that uh, actually uh, there, there is a multidimensional crisis that Mali has suffered, has to be placed in the framework of the crisis experienced by the Malian states. What is important to notice is actually we need to implement, to implement some reforms, but more and more there is, a, I mean, we can observe a slow restoration of services, notably in the northern Mali. And of course, and also a lack of confidence at the local level. And if you have a look to the map, it's very interesting. Maybe the, the, the map on the, on, the, on the left, on the, uh, um, with the density of population, we can see that everybody is concerned about Northern Mali. But if you compare Northern and North and Southern, you can see that definitely the population, I mean, the, the, the demographic, demographic pressure is more on the Southern. And what is also interesting to notice, it's uh, actually we, we were with ISS, um, we, we did this report about the consequences, I mean, the assessment of uh, humanitarian aid and also development in the free northern region. And what we can say that actually there is more and more this perception that development is a reward actually for rebellion. Because if you have a look, uh, it's only when you take up arms that you can be here. So this is one of the main conclusions when you talk with, uh, with, uh, with people from the ground. Uh, maybe quickly, um, to have a look to the challenging uh, negotiation process. Actually, the subject of today's uh, ungoverned space, but actually, if we take the example of Northern Mali, it's not a non-governed space. Maybe the complexity of the situation is because there is too many actors uh, who want to control the space, Northern Mali. And now the difficulty is maybe to create confidence and also to create uh, the good condition um, to uh, have the, the states, the Malian states, coming back in Northern Mali. And just to give you an example, I mean, the challenging negotiation process is very interesting because if you have a look, we have now four armed groups. At the, we, we had four armed groups at the beginning a few years ago. And now we have eight armed groups with six taking part in the Algiers process at the moment. And as you know, how the, there is more and more this will from local groups to take part uh, in this political process. You can see that in August, we had f two more groups who decided to, to create and it, who wanted to be, to be represented at the negotiation process. It is the GATIA and also the MPSA. Uh, so you can, you can maybe see how complex is the situation at the moment and how, I mean, the difficulty is now to um, implement the security and development nexus because, of course, in theory, we need this. I mean, we, you cannot have security in Northern Mali uh, I mean, you cannot have development in Northern Mali without security. But at the same time, the main causes of insecurity now in Northern Mali are due to the lack of development, the lack of welfare states in Northern Mali. So this is the big issue. So one of the main challenges at the moment is to do development and security at the, at, at the same time. Because most of the time we see that uh, development is supposed to be a long-term issue. But the challenge is to have development now. And if you just, again, have a look to Northern Mali, when you discuss with people, they say, we don't want the states, I mean, the Malian states, because when the state come back, it's only the army. It's only the repressive, the repressive, for authoritative parts of the states. And we don't want it. 
We want to have the welfare state. I mean, we want to have the promise kept, actually. Um, so maybe to conclude, uh, it's, it's like a brainstorming, so there is a lot of idea, but uh, the challenges for conflict resolution mechanism. Uh, the first one is, oh, sorry, there is a lack of capacity of MINUSMA. I mean, the last attack is a very good example that the, the lack of logistics, there is not enough people on the ground. I mean, how can you control Northern Mali uh, with 9,000 people? coming from different countries. And remember, the countries who actually are in Northern Mali, uh, I mean, some of the armies uh, don't, uh, don't have the capacity to protect their own states, but they are supposed to work together to protect the Malian people. So it's very difficult. The other thing is about Barkhan. Barkhan is maybe one of the main interesting solutions in terms of regional approach of this question of terrorism in Mali, in Northern Mali, and also in Sahel. But, can you really say that the military means are the solution to prevent terrorism in the region? Definitely not. So what, again, what the other option we can have? I mean, Western countries have to intervene and to prevent and to manage crises like in Mali. Um, maybe uh, the other uh, remarks we can, we can say the proliferation of cell strategy. At the moment, we have 10 cell strategies. Can you imagine? The, the, the real challenge is now how can we coordinate, how can we harmonize this style strategy? And that's why the UN decided to create a platform as, and with a, a technique secretariat to do this job. But it's again a real challenge. Because as we can say, there is a, actually uh, fights against different actors because they, everybody wants to find the, the solution in Mali. So it's very difficult to, to cooperate together. Another idea, it's maybe the G5. G5 is a very interesting uh, uh, structure at the moment. G5, it's uh, Mali, Tanya, Faso, and Chad, which decided actually to put to, to, together uh, within one organization. And if you have a look to the table, you can see that you have the three main actors in all the strategy at the Western African level. You have Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. Of course, in G5, you need Chad, because the role of the country is playing at the moment uh, in terms of military. Don't forget that you also have the French-based uh, Operation Barkhane in Chad. Don't forget that we will have election next year in Chad. And uh, the other um, state is, of course, Burkina Faso because of the, the common borders with, uh, with the other states. So the question is maybe, as you see, I was talking about style strategies in, in uh, I mean, the all the world style strategy. The table is just a summary of the different initiatives in the Sahel, in Africa and in Western Africa. So you can see you have uh, ECOWAS strategy, African Union, G5, Sahel, Stat Strateg Sahel Security College, the Joint Military Staff Committee of the Sahel Region, the Fusion and Liaison Unit, and the Nwakshok process. Can you imagine? We are just at the African level. And we have to put also the UN, the EU, the African Development Bank, the, the, the World Bank, etc., etc. So my question is maybe G5, because we know that there is more and more an institutionalization of G5, because they decided to create a secretariat a few, a few weeks ago, is to have a competition between uh, maybe ECOWAS, but also a different process at the AU level uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle term. So it's just, an, it's just a question, but maybe we will see in the, in the middle term. The last two points is we need to invest and improve, and improve prevention mechanism. The lessons learned from Mali and from the Sahel is we ne nothing is new. We knew everything about different uh, factors of insecurity. But the, the challenge is to prevent, because you know that uh, prevention is costless than conflict management. So we need to use the prevention mechanism. And to give you a good example, I mean, in the Northern Mali, uh, droves are recurrent, actually. And the, the population are more and more resilient in the Northern Mali, because they have the capacity to see in what moments they have to do something uh, uh, before, before preventing star starvation. 
So it's a very good example at the local level. So we have the capacity at the local level. At the regional level, definitely, we have, you have the early warning system. I mean, uh, the ECOWAS, which is definitely good. But once again, the, the question is, how can we implement it locally, this analysis and information we manage to collect at the local level? Last issues is about find the balance between short-term and long-term objective. I told you the security development nexus is a very good example. I mean, we need to do both. I mean, we don't have to only have a short-term perspective. And maybe it's, it's one of the main lessons, lessons learned from the implementation of the sales strategies in Mali. They, they only focus, actually, even if on the speech, on the, 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 the text, they said we want to have a long-term long perspective. We saw that actually they were only focused on the very short term because it's about visibility uh, for, for these actors. And we need now to, have to, to combine short-term and long-term strategy. And not only at the international level, but also at the national level. I mean, what is the strategy of Mali actually now? We don't see it. And Mali is supposed to be the main actors. To, to create the strategy, to have a national policy, and then to bring the different strategy around this. But what we are seeing at the moment is just different strategy and the Mali at the middle, trying to choose what is the most interesting, like doing shopping, you see? So this is actually one of main lessons learned. We have to do it. I mean, national actors have to have this ownership about prevention and also conflict management. And it's going to be the last sentence. Don't forget that one of the main challenges for the international community is definitely that states is part of the solution, but it's also part of the problem. And now we definitely need to take this into account and to be aware of that, because Northern Mali is a very good example. Thank you. hear me? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I want to thank Nupi for, for making, making this seminar possible and for inviting such a, such a large audience. Um, we're very happy to be here. It's a regular stop on our annual Europe briefing tour, and uh, we're very happy that we could do it again this year. Um, I'm going to talk about the Central African Republic, um, which some of you may know has um, become sort of the definition of a failed state. Um, and I think it's important for us to unpack a little bit, um, not so much how CA got there, but what it actually means to be, a, to be an ungoverned state or a failed state, um, especially from a human development perspective. We often think of it as being uh, defined by either the absence of state security forces or proliferation of, of non-state actors involved in, 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 or in security issues, but it's also about um, the presence of state. Um, and in the Central African Republic, we, we haven't had that. So um, I'll just talk very briefly about governed spaces and then ungoverned spaces, and then specifically what that means for the Central African Republic. Um, and in terms of governed space, what we're, what we're really talking about is a state presence, an administration, um, courts, uh, a, a place where you can go and get an, an ID. This is, this is the map of the Central African Republic. It's a country that's three times the size of France. Um, so a very large space. Um, which is essentially most developed in Bangui, the capital. Oops. Um, thank you, Andy. So in most of the Central African Republic, we don't have much of a, of a state presence. Uh, what that means is we, we don't have a developed education system, we don't have access to health care, um, and the army also does not have a monopoly on violence. Um, there's a lot of banditry, a lot of crime. The population essentially um, has no access to, 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 to legal services. Um, and so there's an absence of rule of law. Um, we also have the vulnerability of local population to different armed groups which come into that vacuum. 
um, and we have a, a generalized state of impunity um, which which leaves people quite vulnerable um, and this is this is a long term um, development in, in in the Central African Republic, which really started at the at the end of colonialism, um, but where subsequent administrations, if you want to call them that, or governments, um, did not make really an effort to improve in any substantial way um, the infrastructure that had been left behind by by the colonial power. And so today, what you have is is the Central African Republic, uh, a population of 4.6 million people, ranking second to last on the Human Development Indicators Index. Um, you have 77.5% of the population being defined as, as working poor, in other words, uh, no real income to speak of, 80% subsistence agriculture, highly underdeveloped economy and other sectors, in spite of the presence of, of natural resources such as wood, diamonds and gold and uranium. Um, education levels are also very, very low. Um, we've, uh, in the Central African Republic, had five coups coups since independence. The latest is Bozize, who was overthrown in, in March last year. Um, it's also a state where the connection between the political elite in the capital, Bangui, and, and the population living anywhere else in, in the country is, it has completely ruptured. There's an absence of confidence on, beha on behalf of the population in the political elite. And the political elite tends to govern in Bangui. Um, and even there, quite meagerly. If you if you were to visit Bangui, I think you would be not terribly impressed at the state of services, the state of infrastructure, and so forth. So, not there's no real social contract between governments. There's no history of that. There's no uh, no no precedent for that in the Central African Republic. Um, we've we've seen again and again. Um, the proliferation of armed groups, both on an ethnic basis, but also um, on a regional basis. Um, that again is something that led to the coup last year, the alliance which became Seleka. Uh, those rebel groups had actually been around in the Central African Republic for, for quite a few years, um, but eventually managed to, to, to coalesce and become an alliance that overthrew Bozize. But this is, a, this is a reality that Central Africans have been living with for a long time. Banditry is also another one of the aspects of the absence of the state. Um, this, these days, if you try to go north from, from Bangui to to Chad, into Chad, um, you'll spend something like $150 just paying off uh, people, various different bandits or armed groups at the roadblocks. So this is really a widespread reality. Um, it also means that Central African Republic has become viewed by its neighbors as a weak state, as, as an, an, an absence of political power. And we've seen again and again, in particular Chad, play a destabilizing ro role and take advantage of the fact that there is no strong political power um, in, in Bangui. Um, in fact, successive presidents, and really from one to the next, have used Chad as members of their own presidential uh, guard because they don't trust their own army, because there tends to be a, tr a tendency to ethnicize the army. So if you inherit an army that was loyal to your predecessor, you want your own, you want your own protection force, and Chad has traditionally played that role, and therefore also had a very uh, large role to play in the overthrow then of these, of these presidents when, when they no longer serve the purpose of, of Chad. And Chad is the, the most obvious of, of, of regional powers that has played a destabilizing role. Um, others are Congo Brazzaville um, and, and, and to some extent rebel movements coming from the DRC, um, but also um, from, from Sudan. Um, so, so that's another d uh, direct uh, result of this, this gradual collapse of, of the state. It's important because what the crisis that we have now, this very acute crisis, is just that. It's, it's acute. It's not new. Um, and when we, in fact, look at what happened last year, there was a regional peacekeeping force already in the country um, whose job it was to try and, and maintain some level of stability and try and also work with the government in the Central African Republic to, to reform the army, to undertake a DDR process, to try and improve on key governance issues. Um, even though Miko Pax was there, Selika was able to overthrow Bozize. We know that Miko Pax has now become, uh, was then turned into an African Union mission and is now a United Nations mission, uh, MINUSCA, um, which essentially has many of the, many of the same tasks that, uh, that um, Miko Pax had are now on the plate of the U new UN mission and of all the new actors who are, who are essentially 
um, setting themselves up now in the Central African Republic. It's, it's, it's not just about peacekeeping. Uh, it's about state building. Um, I should also add that um, the Central African Republic was in fact one of the, the, the three countries where the UN Peace Building Commission piloted its new approach to peace building. So we had Binuka there, uh, as a, as a which is essentially a larger presence involved in state building, also during the Bouzizé years and up into um, the overthrow of Bouzizé by Seleka, but not much progress was made there. So it's a very, very um, tall order in terms of what the UN mission is expected to do. Um, and I think one of the one of the things that we feel is very important to emphasize is that there has to obviously be, if you want long-term change, ownership from the Central African Republic of this process. Um, because as much as we can try and disarm armies and, and put some discipline and training into an army, um, this, this has to be something where the political elite changes, essentially, how it sees politics and power in the Central African Republic and governs beyond the capital and governs beyond, it, beyond its own interests, whether they be financial or ethnic or, or other. Um, and we, we, we have, in the Central African Republic now, there is a, a transition government led by Catherine Samba Panza. Um, we, there are supposed to be elections in 2015. Those are likely to be delayed. Um, and, and Samba Panza is, is in a difficult position. She inherited a, a, a essentially empty government with, with very few tools, including having her, disarm, her army disarmed. Um, but she hasn't necessarily made a very positive impression uh, either on, 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 on the Central African Republic itself or uh, outside. And so she also is losing credibility. Uh, in terms of her ability to, del to, to deliver on some key initial steps, like uh, reaching out to the different communities who have been displaced by the, the, the religious violence, which, which really spiked last year. There hasn't been much progress on that. There hasn't been progress either on trying to um, figure out who should pay, take part in a national dialogue. So in other words, not just a, a ceasefire or negotiations between the armed groups, but a, a, a dialogue with civil society and with key actors um, from from various walks of life, including including the armed groups. And and what that really means is that the, the ownership, the, the leadership um, from Central Africa is, is weaker than it should be when you have international actors coming in and their mandate is to essentially take over many functions of the state. And we unfortunately don't have a very strong counterpart um, in, in Catherine Samba Panza or her government, or for that matter, the, the National Assembly. Um, and, and, and that is unfortunate because it, it, it is, like many missions in the past, uh, a very imbalanced uh, situation. Um, and so for the long term, um, w that needs to be something that really needs to be worked on, this, this, this leadership and ownership of the, of the peace process in, in the Central African Republic, because it is just the beginning of a longer term state building process that has been interrupted repeatedly. So um, I don't know, we don't have that much time. I kept it short deliberately. Um, and I'll pass on to Andy and then take questions later. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to the organizers <coughs> for the opportunity. Um, I'm speaking on Somalia um, within the context of ungoverned spaces. And as many of you know, it becomes a very tricky one, a very complex one if you discuss it um, from that perspective. You know, beyond the contestations around, you know, certain actors that have emerged, um, particularly the UIC, and whether they constituted a governance um, at some level, or whether it was completely something that never f um, fitted into the international conceptualization of what is acceptable as governance, and therefore, how do you define what is governed space and what is ungoverned space? What you then realize is that in certain contexts in Africa, you end up dealing with what is alternatively governed much more than an ungoverned space, because even places where you think no sense of governance exists, you have actors on the ground who are dictating the pace and the nature of things that happen on the ground. But within the context of, of ungoverned space in relation to Somalia, but particularly linking it to recent developments in the country, I, I'll try and touch, organize my thoughts this way. 
first try and do a quick history of how the struggle for trying to establish governance in Somalia has been and what has been the basis, the key drivers of, of, of the evolution. And based on that, look at the structure that we now have as a new government, what is achieved so far, and the challenges um, going forward. And try and end, in terms of recommendation, by discussing what I call a determinant mix, um, what the mix is going to be in determining the future of Somalia. And um, the key actors, which I think, if we get it wrong, we will necessarily get the whole I mean, way forward for Somalia wrong as well. But my main point of departure is to argue that beyond the causes that we know, you know, the, the, the form of an anarchy, the form of confusion, the lack of peace, and the lack of structures in the country, the spillover um, of, say, radicalization into other parts of the region, into countries like Kenya, um, Uganda, and the rest, I would argue that conceptually, the biggest um, impact of Angavin Spade in Somalia has been the fact that the quest for stability and peace in the country itself has ended up being a context for the restoration of governing authority over, over the country. And if you look at it that way, you then begin to understand that a lot of the things that happen in the country has always been about trying to restore governance in the country. And what that has mean, you know, for how things have been approached in, in the country. And if you look at it for more, the more than two decades that the, the country has had no leadership, uh, this is really very clear. And at every point of that effort, you find that the differences in the approach between, say, the clans, between the international community, and between regional powers have been a key determinant in how it goes. Um, sometimes being positive, very many times it's become really very difficult. And if you look at the number of attempts that were made in the early 90s and across, you know, from 1991 up to the end of the transition, then you are talking about more than 14 attempts to try and restore governance into Somalia. And that included the 1993 Conference on the National Reconciliation in Addis Ababa, the 1997 Conference on Reconciliation also in Ethiopia, um, 1990, um, the 1997 Cairo Peace Conference, and then the Djibouti peace process, which many argue was the biggest turning point in the quest for the restoration of control in Somalia. Basically because it was the basis for the inclusion of inclusivity as a requirement in the quest for peace in Somalia. And so that became the main basis for the establishment of the transitional national governance structures, um, the transitional national charter, which gave way to the transitional federal institutions, which in also went on till we have the end of the transition. Now, at the end of the day, you realize that um, any time you realize about three things, and you realize that the role of actors, any time you have actor contestations, you have a lot of issues emerging, even in any form of governance that is put in Somalia, either at the clan level or whether it is domestic actors versus international actors. Second is always the role of the international community and regional powers, clearly there in the pursuit of that. And then again, any governance weakness that emerges, either as a result of the failure to, to consolidate security or infightings and corruption becomes a basis for an evolution to another form of, of, of governance. And I'll be relating all of these to a lot of the things that are happening now and what we need to watch going forward in the country. So in the pursuit of the efforts to try and restore governance in a way that the international, um, it's acceptable globally, we've, had, we've succeeded in bringing about the end of the transition in 2012 and there's a new leadership in Somalia. My sense is that after a long time, this is the biggest opportunity we've had in Somalia. And since the government came, um, it's achieved quite a number of things. First, in the area of international representation, um, apart from the visibility internationally, this is one time in Somalia's his recent history where you find that the country is mentioned as an existing state that is capable of entering into relations with its partners um, in the region and beyond. 
Um, the government has also made quite substantial um, gains in terms of taking charge of security, particularly in Mogadishu and beyond. I mean, there are arguments about what level that has been and whether that is consolidated. But what you realize is that even in Mogadishu, about 80% was liberated. And within that, you have huge um, penetration of our Shabab presence and the ability to easily hit and run, which makes it very difficult. But you also have renewed hope in Somalia's future by its diaspora and by its people. And within the context of the hearts and minds um, that we see in the country, that is a huge thing that we, we need to point to within the context of um, crafting um, governance for the country. And then again, the international goodwill, which was really the biggest basis for the end of the transition. And virtually the biggest determinant going forward and what becomes of the existing government. But despite this, what you realize is that the government has huge challenges on the ground. One, in terms of consolidating security. Um, in Mogadishu, as I indicated, 80% was is deemed to have been, you know, um, liberated on paper. But the extent to which al Shabaab presence is all over is something that you cannot discount. So consolidating security in the liberated areas is one. But even within that, we see a pattern of the liberation of areas where it is more about big towns and cities. What about places that, are re that haven't got... Um, cities. What what do you do? And so does it mean that going for the pursuit of the Al Shabaab, for instance, will have to move from the cities to the jungles where they um, some of the places where they are? But there's also a challenge in the implementation of federalism. And I have been arguing that if we are not careful, our inability to make sure that things are done right at the federalism level will end up devolving the level of some form of anarchy that we've seen at the national level back to the base and have and create hotspots of instability. If you look at how the Jibalan process led, what it led to, if you look at the sort of confusion that surrounded the creation of the Southwest state and now even the creation of the state um, with Gamaldud and all of that, it gives you a sense that it's the biggest um, solution for the country, but it is one that has the biggest problem, capable of. Um, uh, um, um, bringing about a lot of issues. Then you have the whole issues about infighting. <coughs> Already we've seen that um, Abdi Sheridan as the Prime Minister has given way to Abdi Wali Sheikh, who is doing really well. But if you look at the structure of governance in the country, you realize that the President is mandated to nominate a Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister is the head of the ministers. So virtually he becomes the, the head of government. So anytime you have a very active prime minister, he overshadows the president. And whenever the president ends up wanting to be visible, you end up with a clash of roles. And, and that will breed in, in fighting. In the, in the past, infighting has been a huge problem for the restoration of governance in Somalia. And it is something that we really need to watch. Um, Abdi Sheridan left. We know um, Abdi Wali Sheikh is, uh, is in place. Already there are signs of rifts at that level. And going forward is something that will determine, to some extent, the stability of the government in, in Somalia. And you have issues of corruption. But also what I call the mechanics of, uh, of ungoverned space. It's, it's been about two decades without governance as we know it. And apart from the difficulties in changing the way things run, there was certainly an inbuilt resistance to the way things have been running to change. And that alone is one big trouble that the country is faced with. And then the biggest challenge is the Al Shabaab attacks. At the level of massive infiltration in government, um, but also the ability to hit and run and melt into the population. And that makes it really difficult. Um, before Westgate, I spoke to one influential Somali um, actor, an MP who was part of the drafting of the Constitution. And what he said was this, that within the context of trying to restore governance in Somalia, this is what he said, and I quote, that a transition has begun in Somalia. The previous transition was one from anarchy. Somalia is now in a transition to peace and stabilization, 
and its inherent challenges ought to be acknowledged. And, and I think that he really su um, summarizes a great deal of the things um, where Somalia is now. And one thing that I always note is that Somalia has made huge progress now. Um, if it doesn't work now, it may be difficult getting it to work again. And so we need to put in all our energy at this level. And purely from the perspective of the ungoverned space, I think that we have what I call the determinant mix, made up of three actors. One is the government at one level. Then you have the international community. Then you have the Al-Shabaab. So it's kind of a triangular relationship where you have the government at the top, you have the international community, and Al-Shabaab at the base. The relationship between the government and Al-Shabaab, in my view, are inversely related. Strong government will imply less and less of Al-Shabaab's capacity. Um, more of Al-Shabaab capacity will imply less and less of respect and acceptance of the government, but also the relevance of the government, less and less of that. But the strength of the government is also hinged on the role that the international community is playing in terms of humanitarian activity, in terms of support, in terms of training um, actors within the army and all of that. So the triangular relationship and how these play out in our dealing in Somalia is really crucial going forward. If we get a, a, a very bad mix of these, we, we will certainly not get it right. And I think one thing we need to watch is the temptation that many actors feel that the government is weak, and so you have to use less of the government. I think the reverse should be the case. Because my perspective is that the Somali government is almost like a weak muzzle now. The only way to strengthen the weak muzzle is to make use of that muzzle. Because apart from the fact that there's a conflict going on. It is also about the conflict for the hearts, the, 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 the context for the hearts and minds of people. The less visible the government is, the more relevant the actors like the Al-Shabaab become. And so the more we are able to sustain the government and use the government and make the government more visible beyond Mogadishu and everywhere, the less and less relevance many will see in the Al-Shabaab. And so that mix will work out going forward. If we don't work out that mix, we may end up in chaos again. And that would be very difficult because the hope that the, the international community has, the efforts they put in, the goodwill of the Somali diaspora, I mean, the will of the leadership at the moment, if all of these fail, there will be a rollback and relapse in terms of commitment to making it work again. And that is going to be really difficult. That would then be when we may see the actual practicality of, of, of our ungoverned space in the country. At the moment, I think that we've made some strides and we just need to sustain it at one level, but also make sure it's consolidated and moved forward. I'll end there so that we can have a chat around that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all three of you, for your very insightful briefings. I'll open the floor to you now for questions and comments. And I'll ask you to identify yourself before you ask questions and tell me who you are addressing. Again, Lee will bring around a microphone, two microphones. So, anybody want to go first? <laughs> Anybody? No? Yes, it's coming behind you. Hello, my name is uh, Thomas Rohn. I'm uh, working at Björknes University College, uh, teaching peace and conflict studies. And I write a PhD on the Central African Republic in conflict and identity. And I'm just wondering, uh, I th think it's interesting what you said about the lack of institution building in the Central African Republic, because you have other conflicts such as, I mean, say Angola, where there's been a number of coups, but uh, after the coup, you see the coup makers reform institutions trying to prove that they can govern the country, whereas in the Central African Republic, that hasn't happened. So I'm, I'm just wondering, what do you think the key reasons for that are, that, that you don't see this institution building in car? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I think if you, I mean, you, 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 you know about the CAR. If you look at the history of, of governance there, or of governments, I should say there. I mean, we have that era where, you know, David Daco, Bocasa, very heavily supported by the French. Um, and I think years where really challenging the government for the absence of performance was, was not a dynamic uh, at all. Um, and and that's that's a rupture I think that you see in other Central African countries as well. Also the DRC, for example, um, Bokassa is fondly remembered, as you may know, um, if you've been to Bongi, for having built something. Uh, he's built some roads and buildings, um, and it's surprising how much nostalgia there is for him for that little that he did do. I think it's a, a telling uh, telling about low expectations. Um, the people who came after him. Um, in many ways, I think some didn't have time. Uh, André, well, André Kulingba was, was, was democratically elected, but then overthrown as well. Um, and I think it's it, it, Bokassa and, and David Daco to some extent as well really instilled this sense of government being a predatory factor. Um, I mean, Bokassa crowned himself as emperor. I think that says it all in many ways. He, he felt he was, he was the Central African Republic and the Central African Republic was his. Um, and that tradition just hasn't really been been changed. Um, and w we know that successive presidents have come in, Patassé, Bozizé, have have created their own wings of the army that are loyal to them, they have used their own uh, people from their own ethnic areas, uh, from their own areas and their own ethnic groups, um, essentially to to both run the, the army, run, run the institutions, run the economy, and so far as one can say that they were run. And there just isn't that tradition. There, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't want to use the word tradition. There isn't that um, practice. There isn't that sense of accountability. I, I think we have doubts as well about the few elections that have been that have taken place. Kulingba, Bozize had two elections. Um, to what extent those were, uh, and even Patasse was elected. To what extent those were free and fair? We we did have Minurka there to oversee the election of Patasse, but Patasse didn't stay long enough really to have delivered, um, and also had particular things that he 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 had on his agenda. Um, and so, in some ways, I mean, there is this this sense that. Um, you know, one part of the country was favored by one president. When another takes over, it's time to favor that part of the country, as opposed to governing for the entire country. Um, and and I, I, I don't think we're, unfortunately, at the end of that, when you look at the way in which, you know, the, 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 the government that we have now is, is, is behaving and, and some of the, the tendencies we think, uh, Samba Panza, also favoring people from, from where she comes from. And I mean, some of that is a little bit, you know, maybe those are people with whom she feels comfortable and has, has worked before. Um, so we, we try not to be too critical, but, um, but there is certainly that, that's just a historical pattern. And I think that's key to, break you know, breaking is key, key to long-term state building is breaking that and having a, a government that that is is not working for itself or a president that is not working for himself or herself and and moving beyond that and until you do that this will be you know endless um okay thanks anybody else questions yeah ingrid <laughs> She will come with the microphone. <laughs> yeah, my name is Grise Nuruk from the uh, Department of uh, International Environment and Development Studies at OS. I would like to ask a question about Northern Mali, also the conflict in Mali, because it was very interesting to listen to you, easy to follow. I'm not an expert on security, but maybe more on the development side. And you mentioned that one of the big challenges, also, the conflict is in Mali is a multidimensional crisis, that's clear. But one of the main drivers is poverty and lack of development and marginalization of the northern parts of Mali. Um, and you said one of the challenges is to combine security and development. And I would like to know a little bit more about the thinking around this, because you have different actors in northern Mali, both on the security side and on the development side, still working. For example, the civil society is still there, local civil society, international actors, and you have the police, you have the, the armed forces, the national, and you have, of course, the UN forces. And I would like to know a little bit more of the thinking of mechanisms that could be put in place 
to combine development and security, both in the long term, no, in the short term and the long term. Because this is really a, a huge challenge, and civil military collaboration is not always the, the answer to this. So. Yeah, thank you for your question. It, it is definitely the, the difficult question for everybody on the ground. I mean, trying to combine the humanitarian aspects because you need to uh, have enough security for humanitarian, uh, to have a mean, a humanitarian assistance. Um, I think um, in the very short term, of course, you need to have militaries trying to secure, but at the same time, if you have a look at MINUSMA, for instance, it's very difficult. I mean, except in the city of Gao, the city of Tombuktu, and we don't talk about Kidal, uh, uh, there is no security in the other region. So how can you do? When we did this report, we thought that maybe one of the solutions could be to use local actually actors, because they live there, they know the people around them. But you know, there is very, uh, I mean, there is consequences of the system, of the clientelist system in Nova Mali, that even if you use actually local actors, they try, for instance, to, distrib to distribute the, the, the foods. They just use their own uh, groups uh, to, give, to give food. I mean, there, there is no uh, collective conception of the, of the public goods. Th this is one of the main challenges. I mean, there is also instrumentalization of international help, 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 aids, sorry. Um, because if you have a look again, I mean, everybody wants to be a consultant for the international community now because of course, I told you that we need to do assessment. So everybody at, at the moment is doing an assessment of where we failed, what was the real success. But to have the assessment, you need to talk with people from the ground and people from the ground want to be paid. So we are created another informal economy by paying these people just to give us, to give them the opportunity to talk about what they are living every day. You see, so it's very difficult at the moment because it's a very complex system. I mean, at every step you have to take care because there are always this temptation to use the international implication in Nova Mali to have some individual or collective gain, but not in a way to create public goods, but in the very narrow uh, perspective. So. I mean, we try to find some solution. One of the solutions could be to identify with which local organization you can work, you, you can work actually. So to have a collective list, I mean, that the, for instance, the different donors have the capacity to identify which actor we can trust actually, to be sure that if we give money, if we give supports, they're gonna do it and they're gonna do it, I mean, properly. Uh, this is the, 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 the main challenge. The other one is also to, uh, as you said, I mean, to have a, a increasing uh, implication of uh, civil society and more and more from the women, actually, uh, because, as you know, they are most of the time they have the, the main victims and they, they, they try to protect their, their children, they try to play a better role. So more and more you see this local initiative around women, I mean, trying to have a better involvement of, uh, of women uh, at the local level. And actually it's doing quite well. Uh, but um, what can I say again? I mean, the, the definitely the main challenge is, is about youth employment. I mean, we, we don't have now the solution. What can we suggest? When you have the capacity to have a lot of money just by taking uh, up arms and when you just do nothing during the day, it's a little bit a cliche, but actually this is the reality of a day, I mean, of every day. Uh, so what we suggested, because actually at the ISS we had some junior fellow and uh, two of them were from Gao and, uh, and they are very smart. So what we suggested maybe is maybe to have 
program for young uh, Malian uh, students uh, and trying to involve them in, you know, the some UN agency, some uh, different, uh, maybe to be consultant for the EU, uh, to work closely with other center research uh, research centers. You see, but try to 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 think that Nova Mali is not only about the 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 future of of. Uh, I mean, it's not only. Um, Rebel. We are not talking about only rebellion. There is also very smart people. So how can you use the, this these people to work with them? And uh, this is also one of the solutions we we try to to identify. But actually, the real I mean, again, the real problem is about money. I mean, there is so many. There, there is a lot of money in Mali. Mali is money is not the. I mean, it's not about money. It's about organization. We need to reorganize. Uh, Stephanie was talking about the social contract in Central Africa. It's exactly the same in Northern Mali. How can we create? I mean, and, and we are not sure that at the beginning we had this social contract. So how can what what can what can be the basis? at the political level? How can we try to give this will uh, from people to live together, to share life together? Um, and, and I think this is now a national issues. It's not about Western countries. It's about a local national project. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Pia is a political scientist. Uh, when I was steering committee, sorry, when I was steering committee member in Sherbrooke uh, in the Norwegian Ministry of Defence, we once got a status briefing on Somalia at our meeting at UNHQ in New York. Faced with the challenges of Somalia, I then felt very helpless. I did not know what to do uh, as a political scientist or as a military advisor. Um, and the next time I dealt with Somalia was when I represented Norway at the Fourth Generation Conference for the EU Naval Operation Atalanta in Brussels in March 2009, and then sending a Norwegian frigate to protect our ships against Somalian pirates. How can Norway, bilaterally and as a member of the UN, help the Somali state building in the best way? Thanks. Thank you very much, and um, you know, I think it's a, it's a very big question. Um, but first, let me start from the angle of, say, the deployment of the flotilla, um, and and sometimes that is part of the problem that there's the will to do something, but at the end of the day, you get a sense that what is what matters to Somalia sometimes doesn't matter to everyone until it matters to others. And then it, it's suddenly projected as something that is Somalia matters. Um, again, if you look at it more closely, the whole idea of fighting terror in Somalia, um, we could have fought terror in Somalia purely from the angle of wanting peace for Somalia. But you have a whole store of arguments that looks at it purely from the fact that there's a possibility of a backlash coming from the returning Al-Shabaab to the West. Now, sometimes if you go with that motivation, certainly the end goal is the same, but you end up capacitating um, and losing the battle for the hearts and minds of people who think that you are there not because of us, you are here because of your interests and, and all of that. So I think that First of all, we, we, we need to sometimes look at how the communication goes about our formulation of responses for, to Somali, Somalia's problems. Is it all about Somalia or is it about other interests? Because that is really important. Number two, in terms of helping build the, the state, I feel that at the moment, support for the Somali government and these six priority areas is about the most fantastic thing to do, option, in terms of, you know, because there's a lot that every country can do on the ground. But you may not win the, you know, the collective battle if at the end of the day you are seen as acting and not really the government of Somalia. 
because the future of Somalia depends on the ability of the, of, of the people of Somalia through their leaders to take charge of the formulation of its future and the implementation of the activities that fits into that vision. So whatever we do, if we do not support what vision the people have crafted for themselves through their leaders and try and prop it up that way, it will become counterproductive at the end of the day. Because if you build hospitals and you market Turkey, market Norway and all of that, beyond that, if you pierce that veil of some form of development, you'll be asking, what did the government do? But if the government is supported and the government does it, you will not only win the battle of development in Somalia, you will actually also win, have the basis to defuse those, you know, who will be recruiting people um, against, you know, against the state. And I think that is the only consistent way to build sustainable governance in Somalia, as where we are at the moment. Let me leave it there because I know it's a long discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then I'll give the floor to you. To just put your hand up and you will get a mic. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a follow-up to Mr. Andrew on Somalia. Um, I'm Per Schöning is my name. I'm working for Statist Norway, Statistics Norway, and we are involved in Somalia through the NRC, uh, together with UNFPA, to do the population census. Um, during that time, me spending uh, in, in Somalia or, or in, in Kenya, uh, I've learned that we talk about the three zones, we talk about the pre-war regions, and we are very careful to talk about Somalia as such, to be able to communicate with the Puntland, Argeisha, Garawa, Kargeisha, and, and, and Mogadishu. Now, my, my question to you, because it's ungoverned zones, uh, that is your topic. Uh, how do you see the way forward uh, for um, Somaliland, the Hargeisha regime, uh, uh, in, in, the con on, in this context? Um, th thank you very much. Um, I've, I've, I've followed the push by the Somaliland regime um, for recognition. Um, and the biggest argument they make is that there's instability in Somalia. It was a marriage they went into which is not working. So it is natural to ask for divorce uh, within that context. And in that sense, the biggest sympathy they've had was so much about the fact that there was difficulty in stabilizing Somalia. At the moment, I think we are at a crossroad. We've, we've made some progress. And so that gives an indication that all things being equal, if we sustain the level of um, support that the international community has put in, with the support of the Somali diaspora and all of that, we are likely to see not complete peace, but some level of stabilization as a transition to real peace. No one knows when. That, but the unintended consequence of that is that selling the idea of of separation for Somaliland diminishes right there because you have Somalia that is making gains. So what is your basis for arguing you want to be independent? And, and so I, that is at one level. Number two is some level of disconnect between the political leadership in Hargeisa and, and the collective will of the people. Um, it's difficult knowing whether they are pushing the interests of the whole Somalilanders or it is just the interest of certain individuals um, at the political level. Because w during the transition, there were certain traditional leaders who wanted to participate. Um, and the Hargeisa leadership said it was treason and something like that. That gives you a sense of the, d the differences and what th at what level that quest for independence does exist. Um, is it everyone or is it just some group of people? So going forward, the viability of that option of independence for Somaliland is tied to the stability of Somalia. If it works this time, I think they will not have any goods to sell. But if the efforts for stabilization that fail now, I think they will actually end up having uh, the biggest sympathy they've ever had. And that can ripple into some recognition across the world. Uh, it's a very complex dynamic now playing out, yeah. 
My name is Ingse Skattum. I'm a professor emeritus of the University of Oslo, responsible for Africa, African area studies south of the Sahara, <coughs> and a specialist of Francophone Africa. I have two questions concerning Francophone Africa. One to uh, <coughs> the Central African Republic. Um, you, you didn't mention the religious aspect. I was wondering how it plays in with the other aspects, which I found very convincing your talk. Thank you. And um, mostly for Mali, where I have been working for many, many years, uh, not living there, but going regularly. And <clears throat> my impression is that people's attitude are an important factor because uh, what I see on the net and hear from my friends and colleagues is that people are very negative to the Tuaregs, in part, like you said, because for every rebellion they've had advantages that feel um, that other pe populations in the north feel unfair. I mean, they, the Songhai and the Fulani, they are... Um, subject to the same climatic conditions and other uh, shortcomings. And also um, um, the attitudes towards MINUSMA seem to me to be fairly negative. They have pride in their own cultural history and uh, don't like foreign forces. And they also point to the fact that in many countries these forces have uh, been responsible for rapes and violence, and uh, so they don't trust them. My impression, I'd like you to confirm, is that they prefer the Chadians and the French to the MINUSMA forces, but uh, I haven't been there for some time, so I would like your comment on that. Thank you. Stephanie, do you want to go first? Yep. for the, the question um, and for the opportunity to speak about that because it's obviously something that is k central in, in some ways to what's happening at the moment. I think y you, you, you surely know that this was not an issue in the Central African Republic at all before. Um, and, and if there are some things that speak in favor of, of a national identity, it's, it's also the fact that there's one language, Sango, which is spoken, that these communities on a, on a religious level, very integrated and really no issues. Um, the, the, the reason for this, this division along religious lines is because Seleka comes from, oh, the map's no longer there, but from the north east, eastern part um, no, sorry, northwestern part, uh, close to, to Sudan. And, and many of the leaders, amongst others, Jotodia, Nuruddin Adam, are themselves Muslim. And we know that in the year, well, in the almost one year that Seleka ruled the country, um, there were a lot of atrocities, a, a lot of reprisals against the population, a lot of looting. So a lot of uh, strong, you know, heavy loss borne by the civilian population and perpetrated by a majority Muslim group. Um, I don't think one can even say necessarily targeting specifically Christians, um, although you know people in Central African Republic may may disagree with that. Um, and I, I think what we saw at the end of last year with the anti-Balaka, it's taken place along religious lines because of this predominance and because of, I think, also Seleka's um, you know, the key leaders, but it's also its profile in general being predominantly Muslim. But there's also a, another dynamic to it, which is that it's it's some uh, anti Balaka are to some extent also pro Bozize, so there's the normal opposition to a Seleka and so on and so forth. And then, and then a co in a context where, you know, frustration levels are tremendously high, um, your ability to, for, you know, you, there's no recourse. Who do you go to when someone has burnt down your house? There's no one to go to. So at some point, I think there's also a level where there's a, there's a tipping point and you take matters into your own hands. And unfortunately, not that it's justifiable, it's just a context. And, and, and unfortunately, that's taken place along re religious lines. And, and, and we know that, that hundreds of thousands of, of Muslims have left the country and are in neighboring countries now. Um, and, and it's questionable whether they will come back. And I think moving forward, 
obviously what we need is both a reconciliation process. And I think what we, where, whereas we don't really have strong leadership in the political elite, we do have fairly strong leadership in, in these religious communities, which is important, um, and who have spoken very uh, moderately and, and in, with reconciliatory um, tones about ha what needs to happen between the communities. And so that, that's important. Those could be really key figures, I think, in, in moving that way. But you also need the return of those populations if, you're try if, you, if you want to restore you know, the demographic that you once had, which is uh, integral to, to Central African Republic. But in a position, in a m moment where nobody can guarantee your security, and that is now, um, I mean, I think w whichever religion you are, you're not going to choose to go back to a place where you were in danger, where you may have lost family members and property and so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't think at the moment, I mean, there's obviously this ongoing struggle between Antibalaka and Seleka. Um, the religious thing hasn't played a huge role in terms of the negotiations. I mean, there are no demands for changes in the constitution or, or for, for, for particular arrangements to be made for religious communities. So on, on, on the negotiation level, on the political level, it's about power and no longer, it, not really about the, the religion. Um, but but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new cleavage and it, it, it's something that has to be addressed very, very quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, as you know, Mali is, uh, I mean, even in Tuareg, it's a very complex society. And you see the different, I mean, uh, groups uh, actually taking part in the peace process as the, the, the I mean, this, the, the, the good image of this. This is the, the reality because they don't have the capacity to stay together because it's, a, it's a, about how can you distribute, how, how you can have access to the wealth of the Northern Mali and notably the traffic. And uh, if, you just have, if you just look back to the, how this group were created, you can, see ev you can understand everything about the future of the negotiation, I mean, in Mali. Uh, so the first idea is, yeah, we don't have to maybe have a to see the Traareg as a homogeneous group, so definitely. Um, um, it's about actually power sharing in Northern Mali, it's, that's all, I mean, that, that's the only issue. About MINUSMA, again, we should not see um, Mali as a, only a country and the people don't care about what is going on in the other countries of Africa. And uh, I remember the first reaction when they knew that they, sh they should have a UN mission. It was, we don't want it, actually, because we have at, in mind the MONUSCO in DRC. And we don't want to have a mission during maybe more than 10, 10 years in the northern Mali and with no capacity and staying there and paying these people with some of them actually rep uh, or women. So we don't want it because we don't see what they want to do. There is no peace to keep. Uh, there, we, we don't need it. And state building, it's not about state building. We don't have a state to build. We are independent and we don't, we don't care about MINUSMA. And, uh, you know, in, for the, the French people, I mean, they, they, they call MINUSMA amusement because they, they are here only to have fun and uh, mainly in Bamako. So the first reaction was very negative about MINUSMA. Um, concerning the French, it depends on which, actually, which region and which city, because, you know, the case of Kidal, I mean, it's a very specific one, but it's a very good, I mean, uh, opportunity to see how French, I mean, it's very difficult because the situation is evolving since the, the French intervention in Northern Mali. And uh, I think the situation now is, is more, I mean, it's, it's more difficult for France to, to stay in, in, in Bamako, in, uh, in, in Northern Mali. And uh, that, that's why they decided to stay in Gao. I mean, it's, and maybe go uh, further in the north. Um, about the Chadian, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same. I mean, they are not coming from Western Africa, so it's easy because there is no, I mean, uh, history about how uh, some kind of relation. But I don't think, I mean, my opinion is in Northern Mali, they want nobody. French, Minusma, Chadian, they don't, they don't want it. I mean, they, they just want to uh, continue to do business. 
and to have access to the network, and that's all. That's the only way. That's that's why they are testing every day the capacity of MINUSMA, maybe to fights and to the resilience against the different attacks. And uh, that's why the, 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 the first victim were the Chadian, actually, because they knew that they could be the best army uh, being in uh, in northern in northern Mali, uh, so I mean it's also very interesting. We we were talk, talking about that yesterday, and uh, you need to take uh, into account then every time you decided to intervene in a conflict, you change the balance of strength. You change the the way people are create uh, have created some this system actually what we call the the conflict system. You change. I mean. It, even if your objective is to bring peace or to be a spoiler, every time you have people in within the system, they are changing the, 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 the balance of strengths, the balance of forces. And MINUSMA, MINUSMA actually changes in a way. France changes in a way. And uh, so it's very difficult because you have at the same time all these groups which are very flexible, there, which are a lot of mobility. And you have always, you know, now we have the UN mission, but they are supposed to have the ontology in the way they are doing war. So it's very difficult because how can you react? I mean, that's that's also an, another issue. Um, so again, yeah, the situation in Nova Mali is definitely complex, and uh, you have to to take to take care of in what way you can change the the, the local uh, balance of strength. Yeah. Yeah, time for one more quick question. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your presentations, all three of you. I'm Turil Satre, I'm from the Norwegian Refugee Council. Um, and I had a question just to follow up on the Northern Mali situation. Uh, we are currently present both in Gao and in Timbuktu. And my question was a bit also about the perception. Do you... When you talk about perception, do you get any impression that people are able to distinguish between a humanitarian intervention and a more development intervention? Because for us, especially in the context, if we're talking about pairing development and the security, uh, it becomes very dif difficult for us to operate. So just your impressions. Thank you for your question. Actually, this is a <laughs> very interesting question. Uh, in Northern Mali, it's very difficult to distinguish uh, humanitarian and development uh, because you, you actually development is supposed to be a long term. You need to create something. But I mean, when we did these assessments, we are talking. Uh, we we have to know. Uh, I mean, what do you need to create in terms of state capacity? But are we sure that this capacity uh, existed before, for instance, the attack in 2012? So that's why the confusion, there is a confusion between humanitarian and development, I mean, from a local perspective. Because you need, for instance, to give a very basic uh, example, uh, the school has been destroyed. Uh, but are you sure that the school was functioning before the, the 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 attack the attack or is it just about we need a school but actually we need to create everything so if the school was functioning you are in humanitarian assistance but actually if they didn't have any school at in this part i mean no table nothing to to work in you you are in the humanitarian assistance so it's very difficult because you have to have this assessment of what was there before uh, the crisis, uh, and I see this confusion. I saw this confusion uh, actually in the different actors from the humanitarian and development uh, area because it's it's very difficult to have access to the information. And once again, it's a it's a, a big temptation to say we need some help, but actually, what was the situation before the the, the crisis? Uh, so, yeah, but maybe to, to follow up the, the first question, I think one of the key issues is maybe to uh, invest in human capacity. Because uh, uh, school, uh, I mean, everything you can build in a very um, 
with stone is a way, but what you can have in the long term is human capacity. If you have the capacity to train people, for instance, how you can be a mayor in Northern Mali. I mean, if you don't have the capacity to, uh, in, to um, how do you mean, uh, uh, to manage your budget, for instance, because it was the case. I mean, some mayor doesn't, doesn't know how to count. So you are talking about corruption, but actually people don't know how to count. So how can they uh, do that, their work day to day if they don't have this capacity? They don't know how to manage the city. So you see, it's very important. I mean, one of the one lessons learned is invest human capacity. Try to train people, try to see. And you will be, I mean, always, I mean, you will have always this blur, blur uh, line between humanitarian and development, definitely. Mostly in the in, in area where you are in an insecure situation. Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll have to wrap up. So I'll just ask you all to join me in thanking Andrews, Amadine and Stephanie to take time in your very busy schedule to come and give us very interesting briefings and answer our questions. Thank you very much. And there are some publications from ISS on the table there, so please have a look. Thank you. <laughs>